It was summer in the suburbs of Belhaven, Greenwich, on the fine evening of October 30th, 1975. Martha was trying her best to convince her mother to let her out for mischief night, the night before Halloween, when she and her friends would play out harmless pranks around the neighborhood. After some determined convincing, Dorothy, Martha's mother, finally gave up to her pleas and let her out. As hours went by, the worry of her missing child made Dorothy call a few of her friends, only to find out that no one had seen Martha. The search for her started, but didn't take too long. Martha would be found nearly 200 feet away from her house, underneath a pine tree, bludgeoned to death with a golf club. What happened on the night of 30th October? Who could have done something so cruel to such a young soul? And what secrets hide behind the walls of elitist Belhaven? Greenwich is one of the oldest towns in Connecticut, full of rich history and culture. Only a 15-minute train ride to New York City, this coastal town gives you the charming New England feel, as well as the vibrant and exciting city life. The members of Belhaven community were known for their class and power, and no one would have ever suspected that such an affluent society would get their hands tainted behind the barbed golden doors. Social butterfly Martha Elizabeth Moxley was known for her extroverted, fun-loving nature. Born to Dorothy and John David Moxley on August 16, 1960, Martha was the youngest member of the family along with her elder brother, John. After Martha's dad got transferred from his job at Piedmont, California in 1974, the whole family moved out to a spacious new mansion in Connecticut. Moving 3,000 miles away from her home into the wealthy suburbs of Belhaven might have been a big change for everyone, but Martha was very adaptable. Within a very short span of time, she made quite a few friends and classmates were often drawn towards her vivacious personality and self-confidence. Within the short nine months in town, she was already voted out the most popular girl at Western Junior High School. Martha's swift gain of popularity also got her famous with the boys. Martha was a person who had everything in the world going for her. She was known to be friendly, athletic, and talented in the arts. Everything seemed to come very easily to Martha. Her brother John recalled in an interview, She was very easy to get along with, upbeat, friendly, the kind of kid you'd like to be around. Despite her raging popularity, Martha was described to be a family-oriented person. She would often spend her time around the house making sketches or playing with Tiger, her cat. But just like any other teenage kid, she too had a wilder side. In the summer of 1975, Martha would spend most of her days at the Belhaven Club playing tennis or just idly swimming. She would often socialize around the pool with other children of exclusive clubs. The kids of these clubs were described to be of a different breed, unlike her other friends. They went to private academies and boarding schools and enjoyed a wealth that was daunting, even by Greenwich standards. Amongst these kids, one family especially stood out, and that was the Skakel family cousins to the infamous Kennedys. Martha was known to share close connections with the Skakel boys, Thomas and Michael. The Skakels were neighbors to the Moxley family. Michael and Thomas Skakel were both nephews of Ethel Skakel and her husband, Robert F. Kennedy. The families related too, and Robert happened to be the brother of the late president, John F. Kennedy. Ethel Skakel's brother, Rushton, and his wife, Anne, had seven children. Amongst them were Thomas and Michael Skakel who were 17 and 15-year-old, respectively, at the time of Martha's murder in 1975. The Skakels were far from a happy family. Michael Skakel would later cite chronic illness, alcoholism, and a repressive Catholic morale and sexual outlook as persistent causes for household turmoil. In 1973, Ann Skakel passed away from brain cancer, leaving her alcoholic husband, Rushton Skakel, to further delve into a worse state. He would often leave the children home alone with insufficient supervision and unlimited funds. Michael Skakel expressed that even a more intense level of chaos came to rule our household as a result of his mother's death. The Moxleys lived just about 150 yards away from them. The Skakels would often have a constant stream of teenagers at their place, thanks to the lack of parental supervision. Martha was experiencing her best summer days within the comfort of the gated community in Belhaven. Her teenage years were filled with occasional sneaking out, added with smoking and a few beers. In her diary, Martha shared a few instances that happened over the course of these holidays. Many of them were in reference to the Skakel boys, 
as Martha was especially concerned with the advancements she was receiving from Thomas. On September 12, 1975, she wrote, Dear Diary, Me, Jackie, Michael, Thomas, Hope, Maureen, and Andra, when driving in Tom's car, I was practically sitting on Thomas's lap because I was only steering. He kept putting his hands on my knee. Then I was driving again, and Tom put his arm around me. He kept doing stuff like that. Martha also wrote a note about Michael on September 19, 1975, which said, Michael was so totally out of it that he was being a real asshole in his actions and words. He kept telling me that I was leading Tom on when I don't like him, except as a friend. I said, well, how about you and Jackie? You keep telling me that you don't like her and you're all over her. He doesn't understand that he can be nice to her without hanging all over her. It was quite evident that Martha had mixed feelings about the Skakel brothers and often reconsidered if she should stop hanging around their place. The doubt of her own safety and comfort kept looming over her mind, but no one could have expected what was coming next. On October 30th, 1975, Mischief Hour arrived. Martha did her best to convince her mother to let her out with her friends. John, Martha's dad, was out on a business trip, so she tried every trick in the book to get her mother's approval. After some consistent nagging, Dorothy fell short to her daughter's pleas and gave her permission to go out for the night. Bellhaven was a well-secured community. Everyone coming in and going out was well inspected, and crimes within such a safe locality were highly unlikely. Martha went out with her friends, Jackie, Jeffrey, and Helen. The three of them went over to Skakel's place, where they were supposed to meet with Kennedy Cousins. The night went on, and soon enough midnight struck. Dorothy was used to her daughter occasionally missing her curfew, so her panic didn't settle in till 2 a.m. At first, she thought Martha might have just slept over at her friend's place. She called Martha's best friend, Sheila, in search of her whereabouts, only to find out that she hadn't seen her since 9.30 p.m., about the same time when all the kids went back home. After 3.30 a.m. rolled around, Dorothy was worried sick and decided to call their neighbor, Thomas Skakel, who also replied the same thing as Sheila. After 3.35 a.m., she finally gave up and ended up calling the police for help. The local Greenwich officers were sent to the Moxley household almost immediately. After a quick check around the neighborhood with Dorothy, they couldn't find anything out of sorts. The officers ended up giving assurance to Dorothy and asked her to wait till the morning, although right before the officers headed back, they sent out Martha's information to all the nearby stations to stay alert for any sightings of Martha. Dorothy soon fell asleep beside the window, waiting for her daughter to show up. The following morning of October 31, 1975, Dorothy rushed over to Martha's room, only to find her bed empty. The police were called in yet again, and a deep unsettling feeling had started to creep over her. She knew something wasn't right. Dorothy couldn't just sit back and wait so she decided to go around the neighborhood with her son, John, and the first place she went to look was the Skakel household. Over the course of 15 months of them living here, Dorothy had never been over to her neighbor's house, and the first thing she was greeted with was their aggressive dog. Pretty shaken up from the frightening encounter, she knocked on the door, and the younger Skakel brother, Michael, opened it soon after. I'm Dorothy Moxley, and I live across the street, and I'm looking for my daughter, Martha. Do you know if Martha is here? No, Martha was not there. And he looked, he didn't look healthy. He looked, well, I actually think he looked hungover. In spite of that, Dorothy was adamant to find something, so she asked to take a look over at the camper parked outside. She assumed that Martha might have just fallen asleep in the back of the camper, but after checking inside, her hopes were crushed, as it was empty as well. The word of Martha's disappearance had gone around the locality by this time, and friends and neighbors had come along with the police to inspect the grounds of Bellhaven. Not long after noon, Martha's friend Sheila rushed over to the Moxley household. Shivering in fear, she fumbled to come up with the words to describe what she just witnessed. Through her tears, Sheila pleaded with Martha's mom to call 911 for help. She said something terrible had happened, and Martha's not moving. Someone had attacked her, and they needed to get help. Dorothy's friend Jean, who was with her at the time, asked her to stay put as he went back to check on what had happened. As soon as Jean reached the site, he made a gruesome discovery. Two hundred feet away from her house, lying face down under a large pine tree at the edge of the Moxley property, was the missing teen. The back of her head was bludgeoned, and the broken golf club was sticking right out through the back of her neck. Martha's clothes were bloodstained, 
and her jeans and underwear were pulled down to her ankles. Near the teenager was a broken six-iron golf club, which was used to strike Martha repeatedly in the head. The impact was so forceful, the club was found broken into three pieces. The broken golf club pieces were laying all over the ground near her body, everything except the grip of the handle. The law enforcement officers were stunned at the discovery of the body. Greenwich hadn't experienced a violent crime case in the last 30 years, let alone something as heinous as this. The local police were highly unprepared to handle the severity of the given situation. For further thorough investigation, a team from Connecticut County Station was assigned. Forensics at the scene did their best to gather as much evidence as possible, and Martha's body was sent out for autopsy. There was no evidence of sexual assault traced during the autopsy, and the blunt force of her head was found as the initial cause of death. It was later discovered that young Martha Moxley remained a virgin till the end of her life. Whilst the investigation was ongoing, Greenwich local police officers started gathering alibis from every witness they knew to figure out the exact timeline of the homicide. The first person on the list were the Skakel brothers. The police interrogated both the boys on the same day, and they presented their respective alibis for the time of the murder. When questioned, Thomas Skakel told detectives that he last saw Martha around 9.30 p.m. outside his house. He said after he bid goodbye to her, he went straight inside, where he joined the family's new live-in tutor, Kenneth Littleton, to watch The French Connection. Thomas soon after went back to his room, later to work on a school report on Abraham Lincoln. His teachers, however, denied they had ever given such an assignment. Thomas was eventually given two polygraph tests. The results to the first one remained inconclusive, but Thomas passed the second one. Michael Skakel told detectives that he had left his house around 9.15 p.m. and drove to his cousin Jimmy Turin's house, returning around 11 p.m. The police immediately felt a bit doubtful towards Michael's statement, but didn't have any hard proof to pin him as a suspect to the case. 24-year-old Kenneth Littleton was also investigated in the fall of 1976. He told police he heard noises outside the house sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. Before he stepped out, Littleton said he checked up on all the seven Skakel children, and Michael, along with his older brother Thomas and two other Skakel boys, were not at home during that time. According to reports by Detective Solomon, well, his story was that he heard some noises coming from the bushes on the property, leaves rustling, but he claimed he did not see anything at the time he was out. Littleton further added that he didn't see Thomas until 10.25, when Thomas joined him in front of the TV. The other Skakel boys came home within a half hour. Littleton reportedly had no idea who Martha Moxley was. The night of her murder was actually his first night at the Skakels. Although he failed several lie detector tests, Littleton was never charged with any connection to the case. Amidst the active investigation, police came across two startling pieces of evidence. Martha Moxley had been beaten and stabbed with a Tony Payne golf club. These golf clubs were engraved with the initials of Ann Skakel, and upon further inspection, the same golf clubs were found at the Skakel household, but one was missing. Their father, Rushton Skakel, who previously was out for a hunting trip, rushed back home upon hearing the news of Martha's murder. Although during the beginning of the investigation, he was quite cooperative with inspections and statements he soon halted his relations with the police. On January 22, 1976, the Skakels, on the advice of their attorneys, refused to answer any more questions and ended their family's cooperation with investigators. The second thing which raised quite a few questions were the alibis given by Martha's friends. On the evening of October 30, 1975, Martha Moxley left with her friends to participate in Mischief Night, in which the neighborhood youths would ring bells and pull pranks such as toilet papering houses. According to her friends, Martha was seen flirting with the oldest Skakel brother, Thomas, and was eventually found kissing him moments later. One of her friends later mentioned that they had last seen Martha falling behind the fence with Thomas near the pool in Skakel's backyard at around 9.30 p.m. There were more than 200 scheduled interviews held by detectives within the next several months. All of them were given several polygraph exams to complete the process. Donald Brown, who was the state's attorney for Fairfield County at the time of Martha's murder, said, No one has an obligation to cooperate with the police. But in most instances, individuals who have some knowledge that may lead to the identification of an individual who has committed a violent crime are more than pleased to contribute that information to the police. So it's most unusual when an individual 
possessing information, decides that he does not want to give that information to investigators. Initially, the case turned cold for almost two decades due to lack of information. In 1991, Martha Moxley's case was reopened after a rumor that another Kennedy family member, William Smith Kennedy, may have been involved in the murder. William was on trial for assault charges, and though his connections to the Martha Moxley case were later closed off, this whole ordeal ended up getting the case restarted with new leads. Within the same year, the police brought in the well-known forensic pathologist, Dr. Henry Lee. Dr. Lee was able to utilize technology that was unavailable in 1975. Among the items examined by Dr. Lee were clothes found discarded in the Skakel's garbage shortly after the murder. We found some hairs and fibers. Some of the hair is microscopically similar to hers. Other hair is dissimilar to hers. Dr. Lee determined that the hair belonged to a Caucasian male. The problem was he didn't have any hair sample from any of the possible suspects and was unable to make a match. However, after studying the crime scene photographs, Dr. Lee was able to provide a possible motive for Martha's murder. The blood smear on her body indicates somebody tried to use force. It suggests a sexually motivated homicide. Michael quickly became the prime suspect in the case. Soon after, Rushton Skakel allegedly hired a private investigator to clear his family name. Privately, he hoped information would come out, which would cast suspicion on other suspects, namely former suspect Kenneth Littleton. However, his plan completely backfired. Private investigators Jim Murphy, a former FBI agent, and his assistant Willis Billy Krebs, a former NYPD lieutenant, were both now involved in the Martha Moxley case. When the two men interviewed Tom and Michael Skakel about their activities on the night of Moxley's murder, it turned out both boys had lied to the police. Thomas Skakel had disclosed that it was not 9.30 p.m. when he last saw Martha outside his house but actually closer to 10 p.m. Also, before Thomas went back inside, he and Martha engaged in some inappropriate activity outside his home. According to Krebs, Thomas began to cry as he admitted this, but his lawyer cut him off before any more could be said. Meanwhile, Michael Skakel told the investigator that he did not go to bed when he arrived home from his cousin's house around 11 p.m. He'd actually climbed a tree outside Martha Moxley's bedroom window and engaged in some inappropriate activity. Author and journalist Dominic Dune got a hold of the investigator's report and passed it on to State Inspectors Frank Garr, who had previously been a detective on the case. Though he shared his suspicion about Michael Skakel previously, due to lack of information, it was dismissed. This report would give his theory new momentum. Leonard Levitt, an investigative reporter for the Long Island-based Newsday, covered the Moxley case in 1982. He also shared a similar theory about Michael. He shared that there were no defense wounds, which indicates she knew her attacker. Merely the fact that she was hit repeatedly with a golf club indicates some kind of rage, which personalized this thing, which indicates that there was such anger that the two had to have known each other, that it was a crime of passion. Levitt waited for 20 years to report on Martha Moxley. The report said Thomas and Michael Skakel had made startling admissions to the detectives. Both Thomas and Michael told the investigators, that they had lied to the police about their accounts the night of the murder. Thomas said to them that after 9.30, he went inside his house, and then he went back out and spent another 20 minutes with Martha. He claims now that he and Martha engaged in a sexual act, and then he left her at about 10 to 10. If you go back now and you look at the story that he told, it just doesn't add up. In 1998, a one-man grand jury and an investigator were assigned to review the case of Martha Moxley. Upon examining the evidence, Judge George N. Thim ruled that there was enough to charge Michael Skakel with her murder. Michael was prosecuted with the charges of Martha's murder in his late 30s. It took the court almost two long decades to give justice at last. He was convicted after a three-week trial that relied largely on circumstantial evidence. Investigators had recovered part of the golf club, a six-iron from a set that had belonged to Michael's mother. But unfortunately, Prosecutors had no direct physical evidence to tie Michael with the murder investigation. He claimed he was miles away from the murder scene at a cousin's place, where they watched Monty Python's Flying Circus. Even so, jurors later said they were convinced by the incriminating statements he had made, as well as his erratic behavior. Several former classmates of Skakel's later testified for the trial. Apparently, when Michael was in Elon School, a specialty school aimed at rehabilitating troubled youths, 
he had even confessed to them about Martha's murder. One former schoolmate, Gregory Coleman, testified in the pretrial hearing in June 2000 that Skakel told him that I'm going to get away with murder. I am a Kennedy. Coleman went on to say that he, Michael, had made a comment that he was trying to make advances towards this girl and that this girl was not complying with those advances and thus he drove her skull in. However, Coleman did not return to testify in Michael's murder trial in 2002 as he died in August 2001 of a heroin overdose. Michael, in particular, was known to have a troubling past. Though the Skakel secrets were well hidden, rumors of Michael's stay within the walls of Elon School caused quite an uproar. During a group session at his reform school, Michael let out a confession that he was the one who murdered Martha during the night of 30th October. However, the school's owner, Joe Risi, denied any such statements ever being made. Despite this, there were countless witness accounts who confirmed the story. During the Skakel trial, two of Michael's former classmates from Elon School came forward as witnesses. One of them was John D. Higgins. Higgins described the ordeal to be a tearful, dazed, and confused confession, where Michael said he only remembers fragments of his memories of the crime. Whereas Gregory Coleman, the other witness, said Michael quite brazenly stated that he was sure he would get away with Martha's murder due to his family name. After Michael Skakel was sent off to prison in August 2002, his cousin Robert Kennedy Jr. became his staunchest supporter. He solely believed that his cousin never committed the murder and was entirely getting framed due to political propaganda. I know Michael Skakel, and I know he didn't commit this crime, Kennedy said in his interview with CBS 48 Hours. In 1997, Michael Skakel made recordings with a ghostwriter, Richard Hoffman, for his autobiography. Dead Man Talking, A Kennedy Cousin Comes Clean. One specific recording played during the trial was particularly damning. Michael said that the night of Martha's murder, he was drunk, had been smoking marijuana, and was having inappropriate urges. When Dorothy Moxley came to his door that morning, Skakel panicked. He said on the recording, I was still high from the night before, a little drunk. He reported having thought to himself, Did they see me last night? Michael claimed he was worried that anyone from the Moxley household might catch him in the act. He said that he engaged in some inappropriate acts while he was on their tree, but prosecutors argued that Michael was actually referring to being seen beating Martha with a golf club. The counter-argument from Michael's defense was that there was no physical evidence to convict him and that he had an alibi for the time frame in which Martha was murdered. Nonetheless, the prosecution used the trial to paint Michael as a jealous teen. They claimed Michael was infuriated by being rejected by his crush. While he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol and with access to the murder weapon, he ended up acting on his thoughts. On June 7, 2002, the jury came back with a guilty verdict. Skakel was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. The jury and state superior court announced their verdict just after 10.30 a.m., shortly after starting its fourth day of deliberations. Rushed and Skakel appeared almost stunned as the foreman pronounced the verdict in the packed silent courtroom. The public rejoiced at the justice given. It was one of the most complicated and tragic cases in the Northeast, surrounded by a swirl of wealth and celebrity. The 27 years of hell finally ended for the Moxley family. Outside the courthouse, Mrs. Moxley faced a huge mass of reporters and television crews. Through tears, Mrs. Moxley said she had prayed before court. My prayer started out, Dear Lord, Again today, like I have been doing for 27 years, I'm praying that I can find justice for Martha. You know this whole thing was about Martha. She added, this is Martha's day. This is truly Martha's day. While Michael was in prison, his lawyers and supporters fought for his conviction to be overturned. Four appeals were filed, all of which were denied. Then, on October 23, 2013, Michael was granted a new trial on the basis that his defense attorney, Mickey Sherman, provided him with constitutionally deficient representation. As a result, Skakel was released on $1.2 million bail on November 21, 2013. Prosecutors fought their best to get Skakel's conviction reinstated. They succeeded years later in December 2016. Connecticut Supreme Court finally ruled over a 4-3 decision which said his representation was in fact valid. But the case didn't close there. 
In May 2018, the court reversed its ruling with yet another 4-3 decision, concluding that Michael's representative, Mickey Sherman, failed to provide evidence of Michael's alibi during the original trial. Prosecutors still have the option to retry Michael, but will certainly have difficulty doing so due to deceased witnesses and other problems. Michael's legal team, in an issued statement, praised the court's decision, saying that it had done the right thing. The lawyers also said that Michael, who maintains that he is innocent, has been unjustly imprisoned. The Moxleys, however, remain certain of Michael's guilt. There's no doubt in my mind that he did it, Dorothy said. John Moxley, her 59-year-old son, said that the jury's verdict in the 2002 trial, which they reached after hearing the evidence against Michael Skakel, continued to give him reassurance. There's a comfort level on our part that we know what happened, he said. Michael Skakel is now 55 and lives with his aunt in Westchester County, New York. He spends his day taking care of his 15-year-old son, George, and doing his best to move on from the trauma of his past conviction and imprisonment. He's legally bound to ask for court's permission to travel outside Connecticut or New York. I'd like to put this nightmare behind me so I can begin to have some semblance of a life with George without all of this hanging over my head. He said in the email, I lost 11 and a half years of my life. I miss George's childhood altogether. I know I will never get those years back, but I feel lucky to spend time with George now. The death of Martha Moxley was a recurring nightmare for the Greenwich community and her family and friends, which lasted over 40 long years. While many still believe in favor of the court's justice that the verdict against Michael was fabricated. But in the end, a mother lost her daughter, and the state of Connecticut failed to get proper justice for Martha's death. Many believe Michael walked away as a free man due to his connections and wealth. Martha's father, John David Moxley, died in 1988, fighting for his daughter's justice. The Kennedy family continues to gain fame from the Martha Moxley case, even now. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who wrote a book entitled Frame, Why Michael Skakel Spent Over a Decade in Prison for a Murder He Didn't Commit in 2016. Dorothy Moxley, Martha's 84-year-old mother, said the book had left her at a loss for words. She added that truth never looked so twisted and manipulated in her entire life. She still believed that Michael was the murderer of her child. Kennedy's book devoted an entire chapter to skewing the character of John, Martha's dad. He questioned his whereabouts on the night of the murder and raised numerous allegations on the Moxley family. Michael Skakel remains free as of December 2019. The name of Martha Moxley is etched into the hearts of Greenwich forever. A young, beautiful girl was stripped of her childhood before she could even bloom out of her teenage years. This isn't the first tragedy that has been buried by the Kennedy men. The trial between Michael and the Moxley family was a war waged by the entire United States. And while there is still much speculation on this case, we give our deepest condolences to the family of the deceased. Let us know about your thoughts and theories regarding today's story in the comments section. Do not forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. Stay safe, and thanks for watching.